firsthand experience. I thought this was very funny up there when it said abortion hurts women. Childbirth hurts women too, really bad. Okay, so um, I all my I had five I had three miscarriages, five live births. Every time I had a miscarriage, even though I already had a few live children, there was always a sense of loss. Always a sense of loss. Now, when I still had a young child of my own, one of my teenage children, a very young teen, became pregnant. She was not emotionally, financially, or physically able or ready to bear a child, and I was in no position to raise her child. So I took her to reproductive health services where they counseled her, no pressure, counseling. I paid for her abortion, she had the abortion, she went on to get married and have children. She has no guilt, nor do I. I was an escort at Reproductive Health Services on Saturdays for one whole year, and I'm happy to tell you I did. Planned Parenthood is a great place, and most of what they do is not abortion. It's women's health services, pap smears, HIV testing, birth control. Okay. No cheering, no cheering. Thank you very much. Well, if they want to respond, they can. I do want to respond. Ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm just sorry that you had to go through that. I, I'm just sorry that you had to go through that. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you. I, I wish that you uh, and your daughter would have had the opportunity to know about all the alternatives here in the St. Louis area. Um, Brian, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the, what the legality of this issue is, but um, as far as I know, I don't know that um, that cannibalism is illegal. Um, maybe there's a law against it, but in my mind, um, and maybe in most people's minds, it's unthinkable. So I don't really need a law against it. It's just unthinkable. I wouldn't think about eating. Um, is that, I guess my question, is that what you're trying to get across, that kind of a, of a, of an idea, that it's just unthinkable? Um, could that, okay. So I guess that's my question. And to answer your question, simply yes. Uh, cannibalism is something we don't need a law about. And in fact, we didn't need any of the laws until 1800s. Uh, because it was unthinkable. And actually, I was looking through my documentation here. Uh, illegal abortions, I was incorrect. Uh, there was the growth of illegal abortions uh, among many years. Illegal abortions looked at 200 to 250 annually, based on Bernard Nathanson's uh, research and, and actual testimony. Again, the founder of NARAL, one of the largest um, abortion advocacy groups. Uh, so, yes. We want to make abortion unthinkable, just like cannibalism. Um, I've always said if I'm dead and you need to eat me, go ahead. So <laughs> I'm not sure if that that's relevant, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, women have always ended their pregnancies. And unfortunately, they're, before they knew how to do that, Infanticide used to be very common, um, and so, uh, which is or and still is in some places, which is horrible. Um, so, uh, this idea that that if we make abortion illegal, women won't want to do it. Um, I just I, that goes against everything that we seem to know about humanity. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say, because it came a couple times, is that I, I counsel women who are considering abortion, and um, of, of course I make sure that she knows about every option possible, because I have no interest in her getting an abortion or not getting an abortion. It's entirely up to her. I just want her to be, to make the best decision that she can make and to be happy with it, and every place that I've ever worked with has been very clear on, on making sure that women know their options. And those of you who, I know some of you here have worked in Planned Parenthood and can speak to that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear, Arlene, that when, that when you went, 
she was offered all those options because that disturbs me, that idea that women wouldn't be given all their options because that's what choice is about. I got what? Oh wait, that was that was your response. I, I can't so do I have two minutes? Did I respond to that? <laughs> yeah. 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 I just do I get? Yeah, that was a Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna shoot that. I know. Sorry. <laughs> Um, this is a, it, it, it's a, a policy question, and I realize that it seems like policy is, I don't know if that's on the table or off the table right now. Um, so you can, we can think of it in terms of pinkability policy, if we don't want to think of it in terms of uh, political policy. Um, the, the question of uh, who is a bearer of moral value does seem like the question that's prior to a lot of the issues of the consequences, the other consequences of abortion. So it, it does seem like we need to settle that. And if we can't settle it, as it seems like has been, it, it seems like you said, like you, you don't think that that can really be settled. There is a question of well, why then, as a as a policy, why wouldn't we err on the side of caution um, as, as a baseline policy? Understand there might be tough cases. We could deal with those on a case by case basis. Um, saying that saying that uh, someone is a bearer of moral value and should not be killed without, you know, some highly exaggerated kind of situation does not mean you're going to have to throw everybody in jail. That's a further policy question. So, yeah, I'm sorry. So the question is, uh, why not err on the side of caution in that sense when it comes to a base a baseline policy? If, if, does that make sense? I have like a baseline policy and you can move from there as the cases go. Okay, well, that's that sufficiently be different from his question. Kind of similar to me. Well, it, it, it is similar, but but I, I felt like the question wasn't really addressed. I can try again. You want me to try again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind, yeah, please try. Like again. I said, I've never done this yeah, before. Like if you can't decide it, why not bear on the side of the Well, I, I don't know all of Roe v. Wade, but I think part of the idea behind the Supreme Court when they were thinking about that was was this sort of where to err on the side of caution, where how to weigh the different rights. Um, and the line that they came up with was that, you know, con not consciousness exactly, but viability, which for me is sort of consciousness is around the same time. Like that's when you have enough of a weight that it starts to, that erring on the side of caution starts to make sense given the huge um, imposition on what they, they talk about as the right of privacy, and, and, and um, people talk about as the right of, of a woman to do with her body. Um, this is, you know, a, it's, a, it's a part of her body, and to force a woman to go through pregnancy, and as Arlene was saying, you know, this is not Star Trek. It's not like we can just beam, you know, this, this conceived egg out of a woman. You know, she has to go through a pregnancy and a birth with everything that that entails to her body, to her life, to her mind, that is not nothing. That is really, really huge. And I'm, I'm thankful that I haven't gone through it. Um, and those of you who have know what I'm talking about. So um, I think considering that, that, the huge moral weight of that, um, then weighing that against then on the side of caution, is where you come down to, okay, well, at what point does, does that start to maybe balance out? And that's why the Supreme Court came up with this idea of viability, and for me, it's consciousness. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm on a passion. Uh, <laughs> in Roe versus Wade, uh, it is not viability. It is any time before the child is born. So simply because they're in a different environment. And so they're inside the woman, then the moment they come out, then all of a sudden they get rights. And so this whole the partial birth abortion uh, debate came up because Roe versus Wade had nothing to do with viability. And it had everything to do with the environment. Oh, they're inside the mother. Two seconds later, she's, the child's outside the mother. All of a sudden, we can't kill it. But we can beforehand. In fact, partial birth abortion, the child comes out almost all the way, and then they stab the child in the back of the neck. And, instead, and that has actually been... Yeah, that's not illegal, and so uh, they now birth the child through the front and kill it through the heart. Same thing. And so the, the idea of viability is completely 
uh, Roe versus Wade did not even address that. It said the unborn child has never had rights in our quote unquote laws, and so now they don't. They uh, they still don't. And okay, so the idea that. Uh, uh, they want to do all these other things or reduce abortions. Abby Johnson, who just quit uh, Planned Parenthood, the director of the Planned Parenthood in Texas, uh, she testifies that they wanted to, her to increase her abortions because it made lots of money. And so this is the director of the Planned Parenthood facility, as of a couple of years ago, is testifying that they wanted her to increase abortions because it made lots of money. <laughs> Thank you both. I really appreciate you being civil and, and good natured with each other and with everybody here. Um, two quotes that I think are very significant. Um, a woman was once touting Planned Parenthood's great tagline that, what is life without choice? And she thought that was wonderful. And I said, I think they have it wrong. What is life, what, what is choice without life? You need life to make choices. Um, the second one is by Ronald Reagan. He said, all the people I know who are for abortion are living. And I think we need to really think about consequences to action. So when we tell a young girl who is pregnant, if it's difficult, you can have an abortion. Instead of a society that embraces difficulty and the consequences of our actions and says, we will do all we can to help you. Instead of making it easy. It's just a, a comment. Okay. Thank you. Can I respond to a comment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you brought up different slogans. Uh, what about women must have control over their own bodies? Safe and legal abortion is every woman's right. Who decides? You decide. Freedom of choice, a basic American right. Uh, and then we can also see that Bernard Nathanson, again, responsible for 75,000 abortions, he says, recalling, I remember laughing when we made those slogans up. And so he made up these slogans, Bernard Nathanson, who is one of the largest abortion providers who is now uh, deceased, but uh, later in his life uh, turned, saw the ultrasound, uh, knew the scientific fact that abortion, that the child uh, has uh, life at conception and is a whole human being at conception, and so then joined the pro-life site. Um, I'm not, thank you for your comment. I'm not sure exactly how this connected right now in my brain since I got a little lost, but I think it was the idea that, um, oh, having access to abortion, you know, makes it more likely that women will be careless, for instance. Um, I don't I think... I didn't mean to assume like careless. No, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not, not yeah. Embracing the yeah, yeah. There's a quick way to... to yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to say that you were denigrating women at all. I, I was just trying to get to the... Um, the, the idea that we have a very high rate of unplanned pregnancy in America, much higher than in a lot of countries where uh, um, abortion is, is even, you know, they're, they're, li they're more liberal abortion laws. So I think the unplanned pregnancy issue is not related to um, abortion access. I think it's related to, you know, sex education, to comfort with sexuality and talking about sexuality with access to good contraception. Um, because otherwise we would see in other in countries with more liberal abortion um, policy that, that they would have higher rates of unplanned pregnancy than they, than they don't. Hi. Um, prior to 1865, half of the United States of America believed that the black slave population, the black slave population wasn't life and it didn't have rights. And in 1943, Hitler believed that the Jew weren't life, they weren't human, they weren't allowed to live. Ger pretend that it's 1943 and a German officer has a gun pointed at you, and he wants you to get into a bulldozer and drive it forward. In front of the bulldozer is a pit containing 300 Jews who have just been shot. Some of them are still living, and he wants you to bury them alive. If you don't do what he says, he's going to kill you and do it himself. This is a yes or no question. Would you drive it forward? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I, 
I kind of got lost in that I'm discussion um, because I was thinking about just that concept of um, how I don't equate black people or Jewish people no, with um, it's just life in general with making uh, the decision. Jesus. So, can I can you repeat the question then? Would I? Would just I, the last. Is it would I kill Jews? Is that the <laughs> idea? Devaluing life. Oh, it's not giving life at all. Those people, the 300 people in that pit, do they have a right to live or not? Would you drive it forward? Would you take their life? Would I kill 300 people? Of course not. <laughs> am I, I'm sorry, am I misunderstanding the question? I, I don't think so. I think Maybe. I can explain it. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, well, I think I know what your question is, okay? Uh, a person, and the thing is, it's dehumanization of some sort. So if you dehumanize the, uh, the unborn, what other segment of society can you dehumanize? We dehumanize blacks and we made them slaves. And during the Holocaust in Germany, the Jews were dehumanized. Now they, we, they killed 5.9 million of those. Soviet POWs, 3.3 million. Uh, homosexuals, 5,000 or to 15,000. Jehovah's Witness, 2,000 to 5,000. Uh, Romanian, Romanians, uh, 220,000. So they dehumanized a segment of the population. And so basically the question is, would you kill the Jewish people uh, to save your own life uh, because the, uh, the Germans dehumanized those people? I understand. I'm going to answer real quick, um, just because I finally understand the question. Um, and I would just say that, again, if we look at other countries, the countries that have the most liberal abortion laws are actually also the countries that show the most respect for um, human life that, that we all would agree on as human life, you know, um, that, that, um, that respect people despite their race and their age and their um, disability and their religion and and what have you. So I think if one of the concerns is that um, having legal abortion makes a society dehumanize people, if we look at the, the societies in the world that have legal abortion, they actually are the most humane to, to people. I, I'd like, you know, I'd like her to prove that if later on oh, with some kind of facts. We do actually have a follow-up discussion, so all the Two weeks from now, we do have a follow-up discussion, so all the factual claims that we can't necessarily settle this instant, we will be looking up and checking on and then talking about again. So don't worry about that. Unless you're not coming, check, then you should worry. Check, <laughs> check our facts. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I have a quick question for you. Sure. You cite the figure that there are about uh, 1.3 million abortions performed annually. I take it in the United States. Correct. United if that's States. the case, uh, doesn't that figure in itself uh, indicate strongly that there are a number of women out there who wish have made a choice in concert with their doctors to have an abortion? And uh, if, if we recognize that decision on their part, would you in some way prohibit them from exercising that choice? Uh, yes, uh, uh, 1.3 million is an accurate number. In fact, in 1984, when I was born, it was 1.5 million. So a total of 53 million children since 1973. Uh, and so there's a lot of decisions, right? And you, you, you talk about the decision you need to make with your doctor, right? and that we should have an opportunity to talk with our doctor. Well, I know for a fact that the girls do not talk with a doctor before they have an abortion. That's not what he asked. Oh, that's not what he asked. Hey, hey, hey. hey. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, basically what happens is they have a counseling session with a advocate, an advocate or, or counselor, and they, they talk about the procedure, how it's going to happen. They walk into the room. They, you know, whatever happens, uh, whether they have an anesthesia or not, the doctor walks in, performs the abortion, and walks out. So there is no consultation between the doctor uh, patient. 
uh, within the abortion industry. And so the, the I, question I didn't was. I the term counseling, I said in concert with. Okay. Again, uh, I'll, I'll kind of, uh, maybe I'm not educated enough on that uh, doctor client privilege, uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, I'll put that as, aside. But you did ask, uh, what was your main, main question? Would you prohibit would I from prohibit? exercising their choice? Um, I would I would like to, again, make abortion unthinkable, thus the doctors wouldn't have a job to do. Uh, and so I, I certainly would pray for those doctors, and they, they a lot of them are being converted, and it's hard to even find them. In Colombia, they're going through several doctors right now, and they can't even find uh, someone to provide that service. So again, making it unthinkable, I'm not going to prevent uh, that from happening, although I would you know, love them to all stop, and that's why we're there praying and providing an alternative. Well, not being able to find a doctor who can give you a service that you desperately need um, is not really the same thing as making it unthinkable. It's just making it not possible. Um, and again, I mean, I, I think where we can find common ground here is that nobody wants um, a woman to have to go through the you know, the having to having have an abortion. Um, and how how can we do that? You know, making it illegal is not going to help. Um, making it unthinkable may, may help. Um, but uh, really the best way to do that is, is to make sure that women aren't getting pregnant in the first place if they don't want to. I'm going to shoot for the back since I've been... This one's for Brian. I often stand outside the St. Louis Cathedral carrying my pro-choice sign. Many people coming out of the church give me a big thumbs up. Does it bother me that Christians have abortions at the same rate as the general public? <laughs> Tom, it's good to see you. Tom and I, we're, we're good friends. Right? bothers me a lot that those Christians who sit in the pews are not reacting and saying, this is wrong, and they're going through it anyways. And so the, the problem, the, 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 the weight comes on the Christian community to say, hey, let's offer all these alternatives. The problem is these girls don't know. Again, I'll cite this statistic that 95 90 to 95 percent of all women who know that they have an alternative and see an ultrasound choose not to have an abortion. And so uh, these are abortion-minded women who are going to go in and have it done. And so if, if they see alternatives, then yeah. And so again, it bothers me a lot that the Christian community is also uh, having abortions. I like that fact check, by the way. Um, it bothers me too, particularly because um, if, if, if women or people who believe in choice are sitting in, in churches and listening to um, these messages that are condemning women for making that choice, that are um, telling them that they're going to go to hell, and I understand that they don't sometimes, and I'm glad that they don't sometimes, but I've talked to women who have been told that they're going to go to hell, so whatever minority. Or, you know, if they are part of organizations or if they're part of religions that are, um, that are trying to prevent access to abortion, that they then go ahead and use themselves. You know, I, I, I think that that's hypocritical. And I, I mean, I feel bad for them because I, I understand that it, it's incredibly difficult to go through an unwanted pregnancy. Um, so I, I shouldn't be hard on them and I shouldn't blame them, but it, it bothers me too, for that reason, that they would that they would be part of an organization that is condemning something and trying to make illegal a lot of the time something that they actually um, then you know take part in themselves legally and safely. Hi, um, I have a practical question for both of you. Um, Sons tonight, we've talked a lot about women choosing to have abortions because it's inconvenient or uh, not the right mind. But what about the, I, I like to have a specific factual question, do we know what statistics are uh, out of the 
number of abortions over a year, how many of those fetuses may be severely damaged, that may have no chance for really normal life. And I have to say, I'm a teacher.